All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Glenn Moriarty. I'm the commanding officer of the PER Regiment and the museum director for the Regimental Museum. I'd like to welcome you to uh, the armory. It's the regimental home of the Prince Rhode Island Regiment, and we also house the Regimental Museum. And uh, today we're going to be unveiling our uh, new display that we have here on loan from the uh, uh, Juno Beach Center, and it's called From Vimy to Juno. What it consists of, it has uh, six double-sided uh, interpretive panels that talks about Canada's involvement in both the First and the Second World Wars, and it also uh, illustrates the connection uh, and the parallels between both the uh, Vimy Ridge in 1917 and the D-Day landings in 1944. Okay. Um, those were two significant events in Canadian military history and also in PEI military history as well. If you look up along the catwalk here, you'll see some red and gold banners. Okay. Those are representations of the battle honors that have been awarded to the Prince Edward Island Regiment. Uh, and its predecessors, okay? And what battle honors are, they're basically public commendations of significant heroic events and efforts and the battles where the unit has fought. You'll notice uh, we have the Battle of Arras, 1917. Of course, that was a larger campaign that involved the Battle of Vimy Ridge. And we've also been awarded the Northwest Europe 1944-45 honor, okay? for the significant contribution that the island uh, had with uh, the Second War, okay? Um, the PEI Highlanders had contributed a large portion of their numbers to the North Nova Scotia Highlanders, and also the PEI Light Horse uh, formed the, connected, the Second Canadian Corps uh, uh, Defense Company, and that landed in D-Day or shortly after and participated throughout the Northwest Europe campaign, okay? So, Winston Churchill described D-Day as the most difficult and, com and complicated operation ever to take place. And on D-Day, the Allies landed approximately 156,000 troops in Normandy, okay? They opened their bombardment on uh, the German-held coast of France in Normandy and has been in preparation for about two years. Uh, the shipping alone for the D-Day invasion was probably the greatest that was ever assembled. A Canadian sailor said that if you did step 100 yards at a time, you did get back and forth from England to France without ever getting your feet wet. Okay, that's how many ships were there. Um, so no other military operation in history boasted such a wealth of hardware. Okay. From a PEI perspective, I mentioned our involvement in the First and the Second World Wars. Uh, Islanders have fought in virtually every major war and campaign since the War of 1812, including the War of 1812. Uh, Islanders have participated in the American Civil War, uh, participated in the uh, Spanish-American War, obviously the war in South Africa, the First, the Second War. Uh, we participated in Korea. There were Islanders that even fought uh, in uh, Vietnam and uh, Afghanistan as well, okay? So today, we're talking about D-Day. So, I'd like for you to just step back in time for a few minutes to some of the darkest days in the Second World War. It is early July, 1944, in France the largest military invasion in history, D-Day. It has successfully taken place, but intense fighting lies ahead for the Canadians. One of those Canadians in uniform is a 34-year-old from Springfield, PEI. He grew up on his family farm in Springfield, where his parents and siblings still reside. He's also married with a young son and a daughter. And he's a rather unique Canadian soldier. He's an officer in the Canadian Army, but he's not allowed to carry a gun. His name is Wilfred Alfred Seaman, and he's about to greet newly, reinf newly arrived reinforcements. So I'd like to introduce 
our regimental padre, Major Tom Hamilton, to portray this true story. So you're the new reinforcements. Good afternoon, soldiers, and welcome to the 5th Field Regiment. I'm Captain Alfred Seaman, the regimental chaplain, but please don't refer to my rank. Please call me Padre. Now the CO has asked if I will brief you on our unit, and I'd like to take a few minutes and fill you in on the regiment you just joined. As a field regiment, we're part of the Royal Canadian Artillery, and uh, we've been here since July of last year training in the south of England. Our guns are 25 pounders. They weigh 4,000 pounds each, but don't worry, you won't have to move them. We have a gun tractor that does that. The name of the gun is reflective of the kind of shell that we fire. So a 25 pounder gun, we fire 25 pound shells. Besides HE or high explosive shells, there are star shells, smoke shells, and a special projectile that can fire propaganda leaflets. Most of our guns can fire a shell 13,500 yards, which is about seven and a half miles. Now, there's going to be lots of training, but there'll also be lots of time to explore. In fact, armed with the weekend leave pass, there is lots to discover in this part of England. And I often sign out a jeep and a couple soldiers come along with me for the weekend and we explore local estates and local castles. And as Padre, I'm also busy intervening on behalf of Canadian soldiers who, uh, let's see, how shall I say this, have spent a little too much time in English pubs, if you know what I mean. I like helping soldiers with their problems, and often those problems can come from Canada and involve a letter. Often, I'll have a tap on them, my tent flap, and I'll hear a voice say, uh, Padre, do you have a minute? And then I'll be passed a letter. A letter from Canada, a letter from home. Some are Dear John letters, some tell the soldiers that the job that they had been promised at home for them when they returned has been given to someone else. And then there are letters that are even harder. Letters that have told them that a parent and a child has died, a family member or close friend has passed away, and of course there's no way a soldier in England is going to be able to board a troop ship and head back to Canada for the funeral. So that's what I'll have them relieved from duty and uh, have them go for a long chat and a long walk with the Padre. Well, the big build-up for the show in France. In June, with everything that has happened in the south of England, we knew that the invasion of France was imminent. And of course, it was the soldiers in the 3rd Canadian Division that were the lucky ones to spearhead the D-Day invasion. But for us, attached to the 2nd Canadian Division, we knew that our time was about to come. So, we, uh, in, uh, in early June, we went to our kit, leaving most of it in England. Um, we made our own preparations. We received our orders at the end of June, made sure everything was waterproof for the trip across the channel. And then, uh, at the end of June, we made our way to the south of England and boarded our landing crafts set out. Talk about jam. We were told that we were in the ocean, but there were hundreds of ships around us going back and forth between England and France. We couldn't believe the number of ships that surrounded us. And we were three days in an open landing craft in the English Channel. And wouldn't you know it, the second day a storm blew up. And the waves crashed against the side of our open landing craft, and uh, many of us had our heads over the side, if you know what I mean. Well, we finally made it to the shores of France, and we waded ashore, and we weren't more than five minutes on the beach when two Mischschmitts came down, flying not more than 200 yards in the air, and they straight the beach with machine gun fire. We threw ourselves back into the surf, when we picked ourselves up, we saw that those two planes had been hit and went down in flames. But we still looked at each other and said, do we really have control of the beach? 
We sure wondered about that. Now, I need you to come over with me and stand at the edge of the cliff. If you look down, you'll see the city. That's Khan, right in front of us here. And you'll notice that it almost looks like it's divided into two cities. And that's because the River Orne runs right through it from east to west. And the north part of the city facing us is in ruins. Why? Well, that's the result of 20,000 pounds of bombs, as well as fire from our tanks and artillery. Why? Because wouldn't you know it, the enemy likes to entrench themselves on the top floor of houses and row houses, as well as office offices and even church steeples. And the only way to get rid of them is to blast our way through. Now, look beyond the Ord River. You'll see the south part of the city of Khan, and then if you notice, the terrain quickly and sharply um, slopes upward. And if you see the ridge at the top of that slope, that's where the enemy is now. That's where the enemy tanks are, that's where the heavy artillery is, and that's what we're going to face in the next part of the battle. Speaking of bridge, as a field regiment, our job is to support the infantry. And taking a lesson from the First World War, it's called the Creepy Mirage. And our job is to mob our shells 100 feet, 200 feet, just ahead of our advancing Canadian infantry to give them cover and protection. Now, the Germans know this, and so they come at us with some pretty heavy firepower of their own. And when a shell, when one of their shells explodes, there's usually more than a hundred small, ball bearing sized pieces of metal that fly in every direction from those shells called shrapnel. And believe me, they can go through anything. You've got to stay focused. And you've got to stay alert. You have to be diligent at your job, on your gun, but you've also got to be aware of what's going on around you because you will only have a moment's notice to die for a slit trench if one of the enemy shells or mortars is about to hit us. Now, when we go into battle, you'll only see me now and then. My job is with the MO, the medical officer at the RAP, the regimental aid post. And I, I do a number of things for him. I retrieve supplies for him, I act as his unofficial nurse, I, I give injections, I bandage wounds, I pray with soldiers, and I hold the hands of soldiers as they breathe their lives. In fact, it was just a few days ago that the MO called to me and said, Padre, we don't have any more stretcher bears, I need to send you out again. And uh, if, if you look down the main road in the north part of the city, You'll see that just to the left is a, is a bombed out factory. The side is what was left of a school. And we've received reports that two of our own had dragged themselves, uh, despite their wounds, into that, what was left of that school. And the MO sent me to get them. Well, I grabbed the jeep and I went down the main road as far as I could. But because of the potholes and the, and the debris from uh, homes that had been shelled, couldn't go any farther. So, I headed off on foot. At one point, I had to throw myself in the doorway of the house to escape enemy machine gun fire. And I also noticed as I was getting closer to that bombed out school that there were two Canadian privates who had become separated from their unit. So I cast them to help me, and we arrived at that bombed out school, and we attended to the wounds of those soldiers, and then we carried them, or more so dragged them, back up the main road. And that's when Jerry let us have it again with orders and shells. At one point, we took our helmets off and we put them over the wounds of the soldiers, and we were in a shower of dust and debris, never knowing if we were about to become casualties at any moment. We got those wounded Canadians back to my Jeep and we strapped them down, and I drove as fast as I could back to the RIP and the MO attended to their wounds. Several hours later, there was a lull in that part of the battle. And the MO gave me a look and he stepped outside for a moment. And he said, Padre, I think I need a prayer. And I just blurted out, are you kidding? I think 
the last few hours have been nothing but one big prayer. But then I notice the exhaustion and the despondency in his eyes. So I put my hand on his shoulder and I pray for my brother, my friend, and my friend that he would have the inner strength that he needed to keep going. He looked at me and said, Thanks, Papa. And then he was back to work in the RMP. Yes, Corporal. A battery, quarter of a mile down the road, and you'll find them. You've got mail. Well, they'll sure be glad to see you. Go for it. Mail, letters from Canada. Which reminds me, where are you from? Oh, Toronto. I suppose that you cheer for the Leafs, do you? I thought so. Uh, you probably know that their best forward line is over here as soldiers. And how about you? Where are you from? Vancouver Island. Oh, tell me, are the trees on Vancouver Island as tall as, as we've been told? 60 feet? 100 feet? It's always been a dream of mine to see those trees. And after the war is over, I'm going to make sure I have a trip to Western Canada so I can see those huge trees. And how about you? Where are you from? Northern New Brunswick. A Maritimer. Ah, I'm from the Maritimes as well. I grew up in Springfield, Prince Edward Island on a family farm. My parents and two older brothers and an older sister. And uh, it was a real treat when we were growing up if we could take the train to Charlottetown. In fact, it was in Charlottetown. I did a year of high school before heading over to Sackville, New Brunswick to attend Mount Allison University. And it was there I met Louise, the love of my life. I can't wait to hear about your wives and sweethearts back home and, and uh, the pictures. Love to see those. I have a daughter, Lorna, who's five, Andrew, who's two and a half. And before I shipped out overseas, we had a family portrait done. And I carry this with me wherever I go. And I can't wait to see pictures of, of your family back home. Knowing that family back home care about us, love us, and praying for us is pretty huge for our morale. And uh, don't be afraid to dream. Dream about what it's going to be like when you get back home. I do it all the time. In my mind's eye, I, I see my daughter at the old kitchen table in the family farmhouse, and my mom teaching her how to make biscuits. And I, in my mind's eye, I, I can see my son Andrew out in the farm as dad teaches him how to fill our old jersey. Thoughts of home. Wonderful and agonizing all at the same time. Well, can't wait. Yes, Private. Okay. Tell me I'm home. I'll be right there. I have to head off to the regiment late post. I can't wait to get to know you all better. Welcome to the regiment! So two days later, Padre Alfred Seaman was rushing forward to retrieve wounded soldiers when he was hit by an exploding enemy mortar shell. The shrapnel pierced his leg, his side, and his head. His wounds were treated at the regimental aid post, and it was thought that he would make a complete recovery. But infection set in, and he died. It was July 21st, 1944, exactly 10 years to the day of his wedding. In River John, Nova Scotia, where Alfred Seaman had been serving as a uh, minister, Andrew and Lorna cried for their daddy, who would never come home and Louise Seaman grieved the husband she would never see again. Louise Seaman never remarried. Back to the family farm in PEI, uh, the Seaman family too grieved the loss of their son and brother. Honorary Captain Wilford Alfred Seaman lies buried in the Benet-sur-Mer military ceremony, military cemetery, beside some of the fallen Canadian soldiers he buried there. His gravestone is located at section 16, row B, number 14, which reads, Chaplain to the Forces, Reverend W.A. Seaman, B.A., 
Canadian Chaplain Service, 21 July 1944. There is a cross, and then at the bottom of the gravestone are the words, and now abideth faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Honorary Captain Wilford Alfred Seaman, one of but thousands of Islanders who answered the call in time of war and who had made the ultimate sacrifice. There were 359 Canadians killed on D-Day, and two of them were from PEI, Lance Corporal Morris Trainer from the Charlottetown Signals, and Warrant Officer Second Class Daniel Yeo from Alberton, who was serving with the PEI Regina Rifles. There were several killed on D-Day plus one and D-Day plus two. On June the 7th, there were seven island members of the North Nova Scotia Highlanders killed, including Lance Corporal Douglas Sumner Orford and Joseph Frank Arsenault, who were both murdered by the SS. And Private Otto Dunning of the North Nova Scotia Highlanders was killed on June 10th, and Lieutenant Seaman of the First Desires on June 7th. There were 574 wounded and 47 taken prisoner. The PEI Light Horse, who formed the 2nd Corps Defense Company, landed on Juneau Beach a month after D-Day on July 6th, 1944. There are 27 war cemeteries that hold the remains of over 110,000 dead from both sides. Thank you for your attention this afternoon and thank you for joining us uh, here at the PEI Regiment Museum uh, today. Thank you very much. And thank you to Major Reverend Tom Hamilton for his excellent portrayal of Padre Seaman. Padre Seaman. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any questions or comments this afternoon?